Come ye, all you who are wearied and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find the rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Laguna Niguel Church family and guests. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, who is the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our righteousness, our hope, and our assurance. Amen. I am never cease to be amazed by what God does. Your first song, musicians, that you sang, Oh, Come to the Altar, really was a preparation for my message. And if you should choose to add it in again at the end, I would not be offended. <laughs> but it wouldn't have been preparation for the message I'd been planning for two weeks. I did have a message I was, thought I was going to give and I was working on. And yesterday, after calling Stephanie to give her the title of my sermon and the scripture message, I, I don't need it, thank you, okay? Gave the scripture message. Shortly after that, I was working on my sermon, and I began to feel this uneasiness. There's something wasn't right. And I prayed, and I said, God, I've been working on this for two, two weeks. I know what I want to say, and I know what I think I need to say. But if this isn't the message you want me to say, then you're going to have to let me know it. And I felt even more uneasiness. So I called Tanya and Lynette and said, uh, I'm really thinking about this. Please pray for my sermon. And I thought about several passages I might use that might be helpful. And those didn't seem to jive either. And I prayed some more and said, God, it's Friday. And Sabbath's coming soon. Don't leave me hanging. God and I are on good terms. I can talk to him that way from time to time, okay? And all of a sudden, the thought came to me of a passage of Scripture I would never have considered for today. It's a familiar story. Not only that, I'm going to give a sermon in a way I've never given it before. A sermon before. So you're my guinea pigs. I'm going to ask you to use your imagination. If you know where the story is, please do not look it up in the Bible. I just want you to hear it, okay? You can read the story later to see if what I said is in keeping with the Bible. We will use our imagination a little bit, and that's okay. I want you to use your imagination and come with me, and we're going to go back in Bible times, and I'm going to serve as your tour guide. And I'm going to, as, as a good tour guide should, I'm going to point out some, make some observations and maybe make some explanations of what's going on. So we're going to pause the story from time to time, so, and it'll be a little awkward, and you'll be hearing me speak in behalf of other people, but that's okay. That's the only way to get through it. If I had, God had given me more time, I would have asked somebody to take the, the words from Scripture and say them at appropriate times, but there, there wasn't time for that. So it's my privilege to serve as your guide this morning. In our imagination, we are walking down the streets of Capernaum, dusty, dirty. It is getting towards evening. The, the day is, is leaving. It's not even dusk yet, but, but it won't be too long before it's sundown. And as we walk down the streets of Capernaum, we come to a house, a typical Jewish house. It's, the, the walls are crude, the, the roof is thatched. Only maybe two, three rooms at the most. And as we come to the open window, we hear the muffled sounds of men talking. We cannot make out what they're saying, but as we look in, we can see their faces. Their faces tell much of the story. One face, the man looks confused. Another face, he's in pain. As we look at another man's face, we see his, his eyes are red and swollen and tears are being wiped away. Obviously, 
He's in grief. You see, disappointment on the face of another. I don't, we're not sure what they're talking about, but their voices start to raise higher and higher, and one of them stands up and he, and he speaks and, and, and he points to, and he set, turns to one and he says, John, you were, I know you were there with Jesus. I, I, know you, I, I know you were there in the courtyard when he was being tried, and I know you were there at the cross, but John, you never defended him. Maybe if you had defended him, Jesus wouldn't have been crucified. And I, I, I'm aware, John, that the rest of us abandoned Jesus in the garden. We fled out of fear. Maybe if we hadn't fled, it would have been different. And Peter, Peter, you denied him not once, not twice, but you denied him three times. Maybe if John hadn't denied him and we hadn't abandoned him and, and maybe if Peter hadn't denied him maybe Jesus would be spending more time with us now instead of coming and going and coming and going. I'm not sure what we should expect and what Jesus expects from us now. Peter kind of backs off and looks at him and says I don't know what Jesus expects of us either but I do know that my family needs food and clothes and we don't have the women donating to the purse to, to take care of our needs. I don't know about you, but I'm going fishing. The others kind of looked around and said, okay. And they get up and they leave the house. Come with me. Let's get as close as we can. As they're walking down the street towards the Sea of Galilee, we can hear them talking amongst themselves. At first, it's quite soft. One of them says, I just don't know. I just don't know what to do. I believe he called me as a disciple, but what does that mean now? What am I supposed to do? He's not here with us. Another talks about the uncertain future as well. What does it mean to be a disciple now? And, and what about the, Jesus being the Messiah? We, we thought he was, but he never went to the temple and acted like the Messiah we thought he should be. What do we do now? As we get closer, we can hear the waves of the sea lapping on the shore. We turn a corner, and there we can see the Sea of Galilee, and suddenly we can hear another voice speaking up. It's Nathaniel this time. Guys, do you remember when we were over on the other side of the sea and, and, and Jesus gave that sermon to the multitude and, and he talked about the, the blessings that God gives to people, blessings he gives to people that the rabbis and the, the Jewish leaders didn't, never gave us. We always thought we weren't good enough, but he was saying that God would bless us. And I don't understand everything about this message even now, but I do know that the people listened to it gladly and, and I do know that they, they were blessed and, and it was a spiritual message like they'd never, we'd never heard before. Simeon speaks up next. Remember when we were over on that spot and Jesus had been healing and teaching all day and, and towards the end of the day he's was filled with compassion, and he says, listen, we've got to feed these people. We can't send them home hungry. They'll stumble. They've been there for a couple of days. And Jesus took five loaves and two fishes, and he fed over 10,000 people. And we saw the fish and the bread multiply in our hands. That was awesome. That was awesome. Oh, I... I I wanted him so badly to, to, to say, I am the Messiah, and to, to take that group of thousands of people and march down to Jerusalem and, and overthrow the Romans and, and be the Messiah we thought he would be, but he wasn't. Instead, when we talked about him being the Messiah, he simply dismissed the crowd, told us to go down and get in the boat, sail to the other side, while he went off to pray. What a missed opportunity! And then Andrew 
Peter's brother couldn't resist. Yeah, Peter, you remember that, right? We got in the boat, we went out in the middle of the, of the sea. A storm came up, we thought we were going to die, and suddenly a figure appears on the horizon, and we all thought it was a ghost. We were shaking in our boots, afraid we're going to die, but afraid of the ghost at the same time, and suddenly John says, it's Jesus. And Peter, remember how brash you were, and you said, Jesus, if it's really you, or, or, or were you just trying to prove it wasn't him? I, I don't know, but Peter, do you remember that you, Jesus called you out and you started walking on the water? You only took a few steps when you saw a wave and you almost drowned. You would have if Jesus hadn't pulled you out. Jesus was always covering up for you, wasn't he, Peter? We're now at the shore. The disciples go down to the boat. We see them re-examining the nets, make sure they're not broken. We watch as they place the nets in the appropriate place in the boat so when they get out to sea, they can get the nets in quickly. Sundown is upon us. The beauty of the sky touches us. And we watch as Peter, James, and John start pushing the boat out. And two men start using the oars. And as they get farther and farther out, they raise the sail. And we watch as they slip off away to the deep where the fish are. Because most of these are fishermen. We're going to fast forward the story. I'm not going to let you fall asleep on the sand of the shore, okay? It's morning. The sun is just coming up. We're watching to see the disciples come back. And we see the little boat coming nearer and nearer and nearer. It gets about a hundred yards away and we can still make out some of the faces and what's going on and it looks like there's two or three of them at least that are sleeping in the boat. They've been fishing all night. They're exhausted. There's no sail because it's calm. There's no wind and so the oarsmen are having to row hard to get to the shore. And as they approach the hundred yard mark, we hear a voice Hey, we look over and we see Jesus on the beach with a fire. He calls out, friends, have you caught any fish? Probably wasn't Peter who responded because he was the fisherman, right? No, we haven't. Well, then... Cast the net on the right side of the boat, won't you? Probably the right side of the boat was the side nearer the shore. In shallow water, where fish would not be found. And they cast the net, and, and almost before the net hits the water, fish are jumping in. Not one or two, but fish upon fish upon fish. And so, Peter looks again and he hears John say, and we hear John say, it's the Lord. You know, I, I think John's mind is remembering something. Peter's is too. Peter puts on his outer cloak and he jumps into the water to go towards Jesus. And we're going to pause the story here because do you remember another event that is similar to this miracle? It took place almost halfway through Jesus' ministry. It was the time when Jesus made the final call for the disciples to follow him from that time on, not going back and forth between home as they had been doing, but follow him the entire time up until his death and resurrection. He performed a similar miracle, and the interesting thing is, you may not have recognized this, but in the Old Testament, God never did 
miracles, and when, he, when the Israelites were conquering and fighting a foe, he never had them fight the foe the same way. Why is that? Because humans are creatures of habit. And, and there's a book I read in seminary years ago called The Seven Last Words of the Church. You know what the seven last words of the church are? We never tried it that way before. Jesus, or God, had Israel fight in different fashions because he knew if, they, if he stuck to one way to fight the battles for them, they would expect that that's the way they should fight. In fact, that happened right after Jericho, right? They tried to conquer Ai the same way, and it didn't work. When Jesus performed miracles, he never performed miracles the same way. Why? Because he knew that they would trust in the method instead of the Messiah. We get caught up in that too, don't we? We get caught up in trusting the method instead of the Messiah. We even get caught up in trusting a message rather than the Messiah at times. I, I, I want you to notice that there are some differences in the story. Even though the miracle was about catching fish and, and, and a large quantity of fish at a time when you shouldn't catch fish, and that they both impacted the, the disciples. There are some differences. Second difference. This time the net doesn't break. This time they don't try and haul it into the boat and the boat starts sinking. This time they get to keep what they caught. Do you think Jesus was preparing them for their ministry when they start the church? One more, probably the most important difference. As Peter gets out and he goes towards Jesus, he says nothing. The first time when he got out, he cried out, Lord, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Why doesn't he say that this time? Maybe it's because Peter knew he didn't have to make that announcement. Maybe it's because Peter knew that his brother Andrew, James and John, and all the disciples, and certainly Jesus knew how sinful he was when he denied Jesus three times. And so Peter's out of the boat, and he's going towards Jesus I think we're ahead of ourselves on the slide quite a bit, okay? He goes towards Jesus. And as he goes towards Jesus, he comes up to Jesus standing by the fire. Can we back up the slides a little bit? Okay, one of them got out of order somehow. Go, go to where Jesus is sitting with, him, with the fish. Go to that one, okay? Jesus... Peter comes up to Jesus, and Jesus is by a charcoal fire. And Peter stops in his tracks. You see, there's only one other place in all of Scripture, in all the New Testament, that uses that word for fire. Do you know where it was? It was the fire Jesus stood and warmed his hands by when he denied Jesus. Peter stops in his tracks. He's by a fire and flooding back to his mind, I believe, are his words, I do not know him. Before, Peter stood distancing himself as much as he could from other people, denying Jesus, wanting to hide anywhere out of shame and guilt. He'd been there alone, hoping nobody would hear him. And now Jesus stands by a charcoal fire, and he's there to affirm Peter in front of everybody else. He's there to reinstate Peter in spite of his failures. And so the rest of the disciples tow in the net that was filled with fish. They land the boat on the shore. 
They haul the fish up onto the shore. They sit down to the meal that Jesus had already prepared. Where did Jesus get those fish? Maybe he caught them, but more than likely, another miracle had occurred to provide for him. Had you ever thought of that? And so Jesus tells them, come on, you've been working hard all night. You are hungry. You need to be provided for, and I'm here to do that. And they sit down and they start eating. But while they're eating, Jesus turns to Peter. And Jesus starts reinstating Peter. And he turns to him after they've finished eating, and he says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Now, let me remind you, there's two words for love. There's actually three words for love in the Greek. In this story, there's only two. One is agape love, unconditional love, God divine love. And the other is brotherly love. Jesus says, do you agape me? And Peter says, no, I love you like a brother. But there's something else in the story I didn't see till yesterday. Jesus does not call him Peter. He calls him Simon, son of John. Remember, Jesus had changed Peter's name at the very beginning when he called Peter the first time. From Simon to Peter, a rock, a stone. Here he calls him Simon. Let me just say it the way Peter would have heard it. Simon means listen, okay? Listen, son of Jehovah is gracious. Let that sink in a moment. Jesus turns to Peter and says, listen, son of Jehovah is gracious. Do you love me with divine love? No. I love you as a brother. Feed my lambs. Listen, son of Jehovah is gracious. Do you love me with divine love? Lord, you know I love you like a brother. Take care of my sheep. Listen, son of Jehovah is gracious. Do you love me like a brother? And it says... You can see it in Peter's eyes. Tears start rolling down his cheek. He is grieving, not because Jesus now said, do you love me like a brother, but because Peter realized that he had once said, I'll defend you to my death, and he hadn't. These were tears of grief and repentance for how he had failed Jesus. And he says again, feed my sheep. It's also interesting. When Jesus first called Peter and the rest of the disciples, he said, I will make you what? Fishers of men. Now he says, I'm going to make you shepherds of sheep. Don't think for a moment Peter didn't see the difference. Before he was just going to catch fish to make a living. Now he's going to be replacing the good shepherd who cared for the sheep, sheep of his flock. And he was asking Peter to do that in his place. After reaffirming Peter three times in place of the three denials, we see Jesus kind of nodding to Peter. Come on, follow me. They walk down the beach. And as they're walking down the beach, Jesus says something very strange to Peter. We hear him say, Peter, when you were young and you could clothe yourself, you did what you wanted to do. But now that you're grown up, you're going to go places you don't want to go and your arms are going to be outstretched, indicating he was going to be crucified, right? Now, th that first part I struggled with for years. What's that about you're going to clothe yourself and go where you want? He's telling Peter, Peter, up until this point, you have lived life thinking that you had the answers. You have lived life thinking that you knew what had to happen. Think about every encounter with Peter in the Gospels. Peter is the first one to speak, usually inappropriately. 
Think about the story in the Gospels. Peter's the first one to act, often inappropriately. Oh, Elijah and Moses is here. Let's build a booth. I wonder how many times Jesus rolled his eyes at Peter. You, you, Peter, you've, you've spent your life thinking you had the answers, but now when you really become the shepherd I'm asking you to be, you will end up giving your life for me as I gave my life for you. Peter says nothing. That's unusual for Peter. He doesn't respond. And because he doesn't respond, what he's saying is, okay, Lord, if that's what you want, I'll do it. But then, but then Peter kind of looks behind him and he notices for the first time that John had been following them. I think John wanted to know what was Jesus going to say to Peter next? Maybe he'd really tell it to him like he needed to hear it. Or maybe he was going to say something else. And John wanted to know. So Peter turned, saw John, he turns back to Jesus and said, Jesus, listen to the words. Jesus, what about him? If I'm going to die on a cross, what's going to happen to him? Jesus said, don't worry about John. You just worry about you and me. Don't worry about what's going to take place in John's life. If he lives till I come again, that's, up, that's between me and John. You worry about me and you, what I've asked you to do. And the story ends with Jesus telling him once again, follow me. It's implied. The truth is, that story applies to all of us. It really does. We've all denied Jesus in some form, and we've all failed. I failed him many times. So have you. There's times I failed to defend him when I should have. There are times I became selfish and was more concerned with what people thought about me than what they thought about him. There's times I spoke to my wife angrily. There's times I wasn't the father I should have been to my kids. We've all failed him, have we not? We've all denied him in some way or another. Not just three times like Peter, but many times throughout our lives, haven't we? But the good news is, the good news is, the same Jesus who reinstated Peter as a disciple reinstates you and me. He reinstates. Jesus is eager to restore us to fellowship with him and with each other. We are all sons and daughters of the Jehovah who is gracious. He is eager to restore us into fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. That's why Jesus came to die and to be resurrected so that we might experience God in ways we never thought possible. One more application. One more application. I want you to notice that Jesus must be our focus. Jesus must be our focus, just as God was Jesus' focus. In the early part of the Gospel of John, John wrote that Jesus knew, did not entrust himself to man because he knew what was in the heart of man. We all have sinful natures. Jesus must be our focus because if we take our eyes off Jesus in the middle of whatever storms come our way, we, like Peter, will sink and almost drown. We must keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That is our only hope. We have all failed. Jesus longs to restore us. Jesus wants us to keep our focus on him. Because only then will we be the people he has called us to be. The title of the sermon was Come to the Fire. 
What is the fire you need to stand with Jesus by? What are the times you denied him? What are the times that stick out in your mind about how you failed or how you weren't good enough or where you sinned? Jesus stands with open arms inviting you to the fire where he will not just provide a fish, but he will provide the Holy Spirit to transform and cleanse and empower us to be his children. I want to close with the scripture that George read at the beginning. Jesus' invitation to you and me today is, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and Jesus' burden is light.